Today we're going to talk about government spending, which is the third component of the national accounts. So national accounts is also another term for aggregate expenditure. So allow me to give you a brief introduction on what government spending is. In general, there are two types of government spending, and the first type is known as the government's final consumption expenditure. And the second kind is known as government investment activities. Just like households, governments spend as well. Now, these are goods and services that are bought by the government, and the difference between this type of consumption and household consumption is that the government tries to satisfy the needs of the community. For example, um, the community needs defense, right? As a country, they need to protect themselves. So the government might spend on things like military, you know, building their army, their air force, and the navy. Another case might be spending on social welfare. For example, helping out the low-income groups, um, building homes for the homeless, um, creating charities, funds, etc. So these are also expenditure which satisfy the needs of the community. Another example I can think of would be cultural building to establish some form of culture within the country. Maybe building museums, uh, building landmarks that are, that are significant in, in, in some way, maybe like the Statue of Liberty, the Eiffel Tower, etc. Moving on to government investment activities, I can think of two examples. Now, the first type of investment might be investment in infrastructure. So, what is this infrastructure investment? Well, you may be spending on things like systems. So, systems include transport, technology, healthcare, manufacturing facilities, education. Now, all these systems are meant to um, spur some kind of a productivity in the economy. So, this is a, is a form of investment because there are going to be future returns. Now, another type of investment I can think of would be research spending. So, the government might build um, R&D facilities and uh, they might even give grants to promote productivity and innovation. So, can you identify any of the grants in your country that promotes productivity and innovation? So to facilitate your thinking, the next question you should be asking yourself is why would the government want to spend so much? And why is government spending part of the national accounts? So, well, the answer is very simple. It's because when the government increases its spending, you will notice that GDP increases as well. And if you go the other way around, where the government cuts its spending, you will notice that the GDP is going to fall. I'm going to use a very simple example to explain this phenomenon. So let's just imagine that the government is going to spend on developing um, some kind of a railway. Okay, so when the government decides to develop a railway, what is required is that it's going to need some construction workers, um, it's going to need some architects, and it's definitely going to need engineers to do the job, and it's also going to need a construction company to manage all these people, right? So what happens is that when the government spends, all these individuals over here will get a form of income, right? So the construction company gets the profits and the rest of them will earn maybe a wage or an income. So that is why when government spends, the GDP is going to increase and vice versa, you know, when, when they cut their spending, um, GDP is going to drop. Now, let's talk about managing the GDP as, uh, from the point of view of the government. But before I go into that, I just want to explain a, a little new concept over here, um, which is the concept of the natural GDP or the potential GDP. And we denote this as YN. So what is natural or potential GDP? It is defined as the highest level of GDP sustainable over the long run. Now, there is a highest level, which means you know, there is a limit, uh, because a country is is, is, is naturally limited by natural or institutional constraints. Um, some types of natural constraints might be the lack of land, oil and gas. Um, let me give you an example. Like Singapore is a very small country, therefore one of our limitations would be uh, the lack of land. Now, institutional um, constraints might include the lack of government regulations, um, the lack of human resources and the lack of technology, um, etc. You know, these are the things that are controlled by humans. Um, so this is known as institutional constraints. So you combine these two constraints together, you will notice that there will be a highest level of GDP that a country can actually sustain over the long run. So what does it mean when the economy is at the natural level of GDP? Well, this means that employment is at its fullest level, um, which means that people that can be hired are hired. There are just some people that can't be hired, people like civil servants, 
um, students, prisoners, um, etc. Okay, um, civil servants are considered um, unemployable because you know, they actually work for the government, so uh, we don't consider that as employment. So full employment means that there is no unemployment. Now, this level of unemployment is called the NIRU, or this stands for the non-accelerated inflation rate of unemployment. Now, this is a slightly more advanced term, but uh, if you could use this in your exams, I think your examiner will be pretty impressed, right? So now let's go back to the question of uh, why does the government need to manage the GDP? Let's look at a scenario where the GDP is lesser than the potential level of output. So this is known as a recession um, because the economy is not receiving its potential GDP. And the reason why it's not is it is in a recession is probably because there is unemployment going around in the economy. And when there's unemployment, this means that the people are unhappy. And of course, what happens when people are unhappy? They will eventually vote the government out of power. There are two things that the government hates, recession and inflation. Well, they don't like it because the people don't like it as well. And when the people don't like it, they're going to vote the government out when they're unhappy. So that sucks for them, right? So the government is going to have to increase GDP to the potential level using fiscal policies. Okay, let's take a look at the flip side where GDP is higher than the potential level. Now, this is known as an economic boom. Although it may sound like a good thing, an economic boom might not always be good. Can you think of why? Well, one of the reasons why I can think of is because um, there's going to be an excess of demand for goods and services. Well, because people are wealthier, they tend to spend more. There will also be an excess in demand for resources. And this is due to the fact that firms are investing more, therefore they're going to require more resources for their investment. So this excess demand uh, resulting from the increase in consumption and investment is due to excessive outputs or income. So this excess demand is going to cause prices to rise. And uh, when I say prices, I'm actually referring to a uh, prices in general. There is an index for every country to measure the general price level. Um, basically, people take a basket of goods and services, maybe like transport, housing, food, etc. They take the average of these prices and they call that the um, price index. Um, can you identify the index in your country? So going back to explain why prices will rise, just take a look at this price versus quantity graph. Now, when demand increases while supply remains constant, the demand curve is going to shift to the right side and you will see that there is going to be an increase in price from P0 to P1. Now, this increase in price is also known as inflation. I'm pretty sure you have heard this term um, in newspapers and on, in, on the news channels. Um, so I don't think this is new to you, um, but it is a somewhat complicating theory to understand in uh, macroeconomics. So, you know, we're going to go through this slowly. So why is inflation bad? So a loaf of bread might cost you $2 now. An inflation of 100% uh, will make that cost $4. If your nominal income remains the same, it this means that you're only going to be buying half the amount of bread that you used to buy. So this decreases the purchasing power of your money, which is something that um, people generally do not like. So the first effect of an economic boom would be inflation. Now, let's take a look at the second effect. The second effect is that the workers are going to have to work over time. So why is this the case? Well, that's because when the GDP is higher than the potential level, this means that you know your income is your productivity is really more than what you could have achieved. So there is already full employment. How are you going to achieve um, a GDP level that is more than the natural level? You're going to need to hire more workers. But the thing is that you've already hired every single mother son in the economy. So you are going to have to make your current workers work over time. So now that the workers are working full time, you're going to have to increase their wages, right? If you're not going to increase their wages, they're going to go, screw you, I'm not doing this shit anymore. So you're going to have to pay them more. The thing is that when wages increase, this is going to contribute to inflation. Yes, believe it or not, this is going to um, contribute to inflation. So why is this the case? Well, that's because firms actually set the price to be a margin of the cost. Well, it's actually a margin above their cost, and um, wages are actually a form of their cost. 
So let's say their cost is uh, maybe, you know, from zero to $10. Okay, this makes up their cost. So if I want to achieve a 50% profit margin, the firms are going to have to charge a price of $15. So in theory, the firms set their prices according to this equation. The price level equals to bracket 1 plus mu, close bracket multiplied by wages. Mu here represents the margin and W here represents the nominal wage that is paid to the workers. So if I'm going to increase my wage rate, I'm going to have to increase my prices, right, as according to this equation over here. This is also known as the price setting function. I believe that this clearly explains how this leads back to inflation. So as you can see, an increase in wages is going to cause an increase in price. And the increase in price is also going to cause an increase in wages. So both factors actually cause each other to increase. This is also known as the price wage spiral. So how does the government ensure that it doesn't go out of control? Now, the government will have to reduce the income level back to the potential level using fiscal policy. So this is one of the solutions to the price wage spiral. So again, we're going to talk about fiscal policy a little bit later. So as you can see, um, prices and wages, you know, they tend to actually screw an economy up sometimes. And uh, the government and the people are actually stuck between this double whammy um, of increasing prices and wages. Okay, we finally talk about fiscal freaking policies. So what are fiscal policies? Fiscal policies are the use of taxes and government's spending to influence the economy. So when government increases its spending, the GDP is going to increase. When the government reduces its spending, the GDP is going to decrease. So that's why you'll notice in the AE equals to Y equation, there is a positive sign in front of capital G. So when G increases, Y is going to increase and of course it goes the other way around. So now let's talk about manipulating the tax level in fiscal policy. Whether it's a lump sum or proportional tax, if that is going to increase, my consumption is going to decrease. And this is because in the induced consumption, my disposable income is going to be lesser because I pay more tax, right? Shit. So this reduction in uh, consumption is going to cause my income to fall, so lower GDP. If I'm going to decrease the level of taxes, then this is going to be the opposite way. Consumption is going to increase because I pay less taxes, I have more disposable income um, to spend on consumption. Therefore, the GDP level is going to increase. Yay! So now let's take a look at the Keynesian cross diagram. I'm just going to set up my initial equilibrium first. Look at how fast hand goes. Okay, so let's take a look at an expansionary fiscal policy where the government increases government spending from G0 to G1. This is going to cause the AE curve to shift upwards and our income is increased due to a fiscal policy. As you can see, income is increased from Y0 over to Y1. So this is an um, expansionary fiscal policy and it can be achieved by either increasing government spending or reducing the tax level. So let's look at the opposite scenario where the government wants to reduce the GDP maybe from Y0 over to YN which is over here. So they're going to have to use a contractionary fiscal policy. So what they can do to shift the AE curve down okay, um, to achieve this contractionary fiscal policy is either to decrease government spending or increase the tax level. So as you can see, my new level of output is lower than why not. So this is how contractionary fiscal policy can help reduce an economic boom so that you won't have problems of inflation and all that kind of shit. We now take a look at the different types of government spending functions. The first type is the simplest one. It is simply the government spending equals to G0 which is a lump sum autonomous spending. So government spending doesn't, um, it's not affected by interest rates or income. So this is the most basic form. I encourage you to use this uh, in the exam unless stated otherwise. Another type of policy you might encounter is the balanced budget policy. So this happens when the government expenditure is equals to its revenue. So while government expenditure is denoted by G, the amount of revenue that they collect is simply the amount of taxes that the government collects. So it will be T if it's a lump sum tax, it will be T times Y if it's a proportional tax. So the budget is balanced when expenditure equals revenue. Now what if we have the case where expenditure is lesser than revenue? 
This is called a budget surplus. Basically, the government has got more revenue than its expenditure, therefore it is in a surplus. Now, what about a case where expenditure is more than its revenue? So the government is spending more than what it earns. This is called a budget deficit. It has got lesser revenue to cover its, its, its expenditure, therefore it is in a deficit. But for introduction to economics, our focus would be on the balanced budget. So we're going to learn how to write the aggregate expenditure using a budget, uh, balanced budget policy. Okay, this is where we're going to need to learn a little bit of mathematics and uh, it might get a little bit complicated here, but um, I'm going to go slowly. So since we know that for a lump sum tax, G is going to equals to T if it's balanced and if it's a proportional tax, G is equals to T times Y. So typically, AE equals to Y equals to C0 plus C1 Y minus T plus I0 minus I1R plus G0. So the question is, do we change this T into G? Or do we change this G into T? So this is the question, right? Are we going to remove away the T or the G if, let's say, we have a case of a balanced budget? And in the case of a proportional tax, okay, this is what the AE function is going to look like. Now, are we going to replace this G with TY? Or are we going to replace this small letter T with G over Y? So maybe just let me show you how I got um, g over y. Since g equals to t times y, therefore small t equals to g over y. So it's that simple, right? The thing is that in this AE function, there can only either be g or only t. So that is the question. Are we going to choose g or t? Now, the choice between g and t depends on which factor depends on which factor. Now, let's take a look at a case whereby the amount of government spending depends on the amount of taxes being collected. In this case, the government is taking a passive approach because they are simply spending what they can collect. The amount that they spend relies on the amount of taxes that they can collect from the people. As you can see, the amount of taxes collected is the determining variable that explains how much the government is going to spend. Therefore, my AE equation is going to look like this. I'm going to replace G with T because now taxes is the explanatory variable, right? We've gone through what it means by explanatory variable. The taxes is the amount, uh, is the variable that affects the level of GDP in this economy. So this is the case for a lump sum tax, okay? And when the government spending relies on how much taxes is being collected. So now let's take a look at a case for a proportional tax what's going to happen is, again, I'm going to replace G with small letter T times Y. And I'm going to explain this one more time. The reason why we, if we take away G is because G is no longer the explanatory variable. The amount of taxes is. Okay, so the first step is to always identify which is the explanatory variable. Is it the government spending or is it the taxes? Then in your AE function, show only the explanatory variable. I'm just going to write this again because uh, I think this green marker is a little bit light and uh, faded. So I'm going to use this method of identifying the explanatory variable for the other case where the, the amount of tax collected actually depends on the amount that the government spends. This is a more active approach by the government because they're going to spend first and then they're going to tax the people to cover up for their expenses. So it's a very active way of uh, determining how much they spend. Okay, so as you can see, now tax is no longer the explanatory variable. Government spending is the explanatory variable because the amount of tax depends on it, right? So instead of replacing T with G, now for the case of a lump sum tax, I'm going to replace T with G because if you saw in the second step, we're supposed to show only the explanatory variable. So there you have it. I am only showing G in this A function. I can see that G is the explanatory variable. Okay. Um, now I'm going to go on to the case whereby there is a proportional tax. So for the case of the proportional tax, everything is going to be the same except I'm going to replace small letter T with G over Y. And we saw that T equals to G over Y because when G equals to T times Y, T simply equals to G over Y. So this is the AE expenditure function uh, in a case where there is a balanced budget 
and the tax collected depends on the amount of government spending. So now you might be wondering how would you know in the exam? Um, typically from our experience, we've seen that um, the exam question would state it very clearly, um, you know, whether it is an active or a passive approach. Of course, they're not going to use the words active and passive, uh, but the way that they phrase the question will tell you whether government spending depends on taxes or whether taxes depend on the level of government spending. If um, the question says that there is no such case, but it is still a balanced budget, um, you can always make the assumption, all right? So choose one they are comfortable with, um, you know, choose either whether government spending depends on tax or whether tax depends on government spending. It's, it's up to you. Just make sure that you state your assumptions very, very clearly. For the last part of this video, we're going to look at other kinds of variations that the government spending function can take. So one of the other variations could be um, government spending equals to G0, which is the autonomous part, minus G1 times Y. Um, you're going to notice that there is a negative sign in front of G1 and the negative sign here is because um, so you know it, it, it is meant for the government to achieve the natural rate of output. Um, let, let, let me explain why this is the case. I'm going to use this simple vertical axis to denote the level of income and this is the natural rate of output over here. Right? So let's say income increases to Y1, so um, the negative sign says that government spending will reduce, therefore uh, when, when government spending is cut, uh, GDP is going to fall back to YN. Very natural, right? So when uh, income falls to Y2, uh, the negative sign is going to increase government spending, therefore the overall level of income is going to increase. So this is how uh, the government fights economic booms as well as recessions. So with that, we've come to the end of the government spending video. Um, I hope you've learned a lot of new stuff. There's some advanced shit over here as well, and I think you're going to benefit from that. Thank you so much for studying with Quickonomics. We'll see you in the next video.